Uh, he was born in uh, 1810, uh, which was a very good year for composers to be born. Uh, Chopin was also born that year, and Mendelssohn was born in 1809, so just the year before there was a little cluster there. He was born in the small town of Zwickau in Saxony, in Germany. He was the last of five children to be born, and his father uh, was a publisher and writer and translator, um, had a huge library and was very influential for uh, Robert because Robert really balanced a literary and musical career for much of his life, very influenced by his father. His father translated Dickens and Byron and a whole lot of great um, uh, English literati. Um, he was described at one point as sensitive almost to the point of insanity. This is the father. So very, very uh, sensitive character. Uh, his mother apparently was a gifted singer, but also depressive. So uh, he was seemed to, to be getting some uh, mood stuff from both sides. And his father had also had a brother who I think had committed suicide. So, um, but Robert, uh, as a child, was very happy at going precocious and uh, very well adjusted apparently. Um, but he was a daydreamer as well, which most of us are at some point or other. Um, his father had actually written seven novels in one year, so this gives you a little bit of a suspicion. At the age of seven, uh, Robert started composing, and that seems to be the age when real composers with their genetics <laughs> start composing. He started studying with a local church organist and outstripped him immediately, apparently, um, and was already uh, performing publicly at the keyboard at the age of 11. At the age of 15, he heard uh, the great Moscheles, uh, this is the great virtuoso who was the teacher and mentor of Mendelssohn, uh, and he resolved that this was his future, he was going to be a concert pianist, he was completely smitten. That same year, his first two great tragedies occurred. First, his beloved sister, who was four years older than him, Emily, and a gifted writer as well, committed suicide by drowning. His father also died a few months later, so he was quite young when he died. So these were huge losses for Schumann in that, at that young age, and he, he wrote about it in his diary very movingly. He also was becoming immersed in the uh, sort of German Renaissance writer, the Romantic, uh, Sturm und Drang uh, um, writers in German at the time. So these are people like Jean Paul Richter and E.T.A. Hoffmann. Um, and also Goethe had written uh, not long before the Sorrows of, of Young Werther, and that had been a huge influence in Europe. There were copycat suicides all over Europe, unfortunately. Goethe greatly regretted having written that, apparently. But uh, Schumann was very influenced by these writers and really loved them and loved the ideas of the contrasting personalities. Um, in his young adulthood, he was described by a friend as powerfully built but slender, a young man with a blooming face, very well framed by his rather long brunette hair, he had sort of a page boy, his eyes were deep set, dark, and glowing with passionate enthusiasm. His whole appearance was thoroughly noble, his bearing was elegant, and above all he exhibited a great kind-heartedness. So he sounds like a lovely young man. In order to receive his father's inheritance, his father had stipulated that he had to study at university. And he had few choices, so he decided to study law. And he went to the University of Leipzig and enrolled and hated it passionately and apparently skipped virtually all of his classes and spent all of his time playing the piano and begging his mother to let him become a musician. And this went on for a couple of years, he, and he was having constant, it was a terrible time for him, constant anxiety attacks and insomnia and nightmares and so on, so uh, terrible mood problems. At the age of 20, he more or less woke up one day deciding that he had to become a musician and that the decision was made. And he informed his mother that he had found a teacher named Frederick Wieck in Leipzig, who was a famous pedagogue at the time. And Wieck told his mother that he would make Schumann into the greatest virtuoso in Europe. So this mollified his mother enough to allow him to start studying with Wieck. And he moved into Wieck's home and started practicing with huge enthusiasm, six, seven hours a day, until 
and suddenly his mood again sank when he realized that a few months later that Vic was really focused on his own daughter, Clara, who was 11 at the time, and uh, um, Shimon was 20 when he moved in with Vic. Um, around that time, Clara had her, her debut in Leipzig, and it was absolutely a sensation. She was immediately famous, and Robert was being more or less ignored. So he became somewhat depressed. <laughs> um, however, he pulled himself out of it, and um, a few months later was well enough to write his first symphony. Um, so th there were interesting, uh, uh, there's a writer named Kate Jameson, who's a professor at, at uh, Johns Hopkins, I think, in Harvard, who is bipolar herself, and she's written a lot about bipolar, the experience, and um, great artists and writers who she uh, sees as being bipolar also, and she certainly includes Schumann in this, and talks about how his productivity just dipped when he was depressed, and it was spectacular when he was uh, on a high. Um, and she could follow his life with, according to his moods, moods and his um, productivity as well. On his 21st birthday, he woke up feeling that he had a new inner companion. And he named this personage Floristan, after the hero of Beethoven's uh, opera Fidelio. Floristan was heroic, he was outgoing, extroverted, and um, uh, very dominating and uh, strong personality. And a few weeks later, another personality emerged by itself, and uh, this was the kind of alter ego of Floristan, very quiet, poetic, uh, unfocused, introverted. And he named this character Eusebius, or Eusebius, after a Catholic monk uh, or pope who was um, a few hundred years um, earlier. And these two personalities, he kept very close uh, for the rest of his life. They allowed him to um, maybe communicate in those different personalities with more support than he had on his own. And he signed a lot of his music and a lot of his writings, either Floristan or Eusebius or both. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more later. He was in, unsure of himself as a pianist, and so he started working with a little mechanical gizmo to strengthen his fingers and managed to permanently injure his right hand. So he was up against people like Liszt and Chopin and Mendelssohn and Moscheles. Um, this allowed him to get out of the competition, which maybe was a good thing, and also allowed him to get out of the army, which was certainly a good thing. He had his first publication at the age of 21, the Abegg Variations. And then um, his next work was a piece called Papillon. And this is written in a new style. He was no longer following the old classical sonata form. It's, it became known as a mosaic form, and he really introduced it. It was a series of small personality pieces, sort of character pieces. This papillon has 12 separate pieces, and it really tells a story. It's based on a, a writing by Jean Paul that describes a masked ball. And I'll just play you a little bit of the a beginning and the end, and uh, sort of give you an idea of what he was talking about. Um, it starts out with just a little introduction, a few bars, and then there's a motif that comes back over and over, and it signifies the participants at the ball putting on their masks and getting ready for the costume, um, the event. And I'll just play you that.
So now they're ready for the dance and uh, follows, follow, that's followed by about 10 pieces that are different um, characters in the carnival, the mass ball. And then it finishes with um, the, the theme that comes in is an old folk song, a German folk song that everybody hearing it would have recognized called the Grossvater's Dance, Grandfather's Dance. And the idea is that the grandfathers are showing up at the ball and they're saying, okay, enough, <laughs> it's time to go home, it's getting late. And so this theme sounds like this. He added dotted uh, eight, quarters and eights. He liked dotted notes a lot. Um, you hear the resistance of the dancers. They want to keep dancing, and the grandfathers get much more uh, insistent. And it finally ends with the um, grandfathers uh, pulling the children home, or the young people, and you hear the church bells ringing, uh, chiming six times. So it's 6 a.m. and it's time, the sun is coming up, it's time to be home. And you'll hear it in the music. concert then in, in Leipzig. Clara played four times and uh, was a huge star. The first movement of his first symphony was also debuted at that concert. It was not received well. And unfortunately, um, Clara had an orchestral piece debuted, which was a rave uh, hit also. So not only was he not able to compete with Clara, a little Clara nine years younger as a, as a pianist, but not even as a composer. He was so mortified that he left Leipzig and went home to his mother for several months back in Zwickau, and then started hearing a few months later of his uh, reviews of his Papillon that had just been published. And uh, they were rare reviews, so he came back to Leipzig with his head held high, and now he was starting to have a name in Leipzig. He also started at the time, so he's about 23, 24, um, 
uh, a musical journal called the Neue Leipziger Zeitschrift for Musik. It's, it was a sort of a comp combination of essays and critiques, reviews, and, um, uh, talking about new music and so on. And it was a huge success all over Europe, and it was actually a financial success too. He often signed the reviews and the uh, articles either Floristan or Eusebius. So uh, he was making his alter egos very public. Um, he also conceived around this time of the Davidsbund band of uh, heroic young people who were struggling against reactionary forces, the Philistines. And the Philistines were empty virtuosity in the concert hall and Italianate frivolity at the opera house. And um, this became a very strong part of his personality and activities as well, the Davidsbund. And now came another uh, big devastating blow, which plunged him again into a depression. His brother, one of his brothers, Julius, and his favorite sister-in-law both died within a few months of each other, very unexpectedly. Uh, he was at that point not living with Bike, but he was in a fifth floor apartment, and he was afraid he was going to jump out the window. So he moved quickly to a first floor apartment and asked a friend to move in with him, which the friend did. So he averted that and pulled out of it again. And when he got better, he wrote the great Takata in C, which I will never be able to play, very hard and wonderful uh, concert piece. And the great Carnival, which is a staple of recitals all over the world still. And again, this was in the mosaic style, and I'm going to play you some of Carnival. It's um, again a masked ball, again based on um, popular writings, and um, a lot of the characters in it are recognizable. There's a Eusebius and there's a Floristan. He also uh, wrote this for a woman he was engaged to at the time, named Ernestine von Fricken. He was not, she was another student of Vikes. And so there's a little piece for her. There's also a piece for Clara, and actually it's called Chiarina. And it's actually much more passionate than the one for his fiance, which is interesting. So I'll just play you bits of this. Masks on in the um, 
in the ball again. So when he liked a motif, he would repeat it over and over. He, apparently, he would sit at the piano and play the same little phrase over and over for hours. Um, and these things popped up in all over different pieces, if you like them. Uh, this one is called Chiarina, and it was really for Clara. written for Chopin. He had just reviewed Chopin's um, Opus 2 and had raved about it in his journal and said, hats off, gentlemen, a genius. Um, so he wrote this piece that he thought was in the style of Chopin, just called Chopin. I'm just going to play you a little bit. So the beginning is the heroic David's band, um, and they're going to have this big battle against the Philistines. And the second page, the Philistines arrive, and the Philistines are the grandfathers. He brings in the grandfathers' hands again. So it's interesting. Reactionary forces of the grandfathers. So I'll just uh, play you the beginning. Robert was nine years old, or is it 25? 
Um, and they suddenly realized they were madly in love with each other. Um, they had been living together. Actually, Robert had been his, her babysitter at, at various points. And um, so he broke off his relationship with Ernestine von Fricken, and they started meeting quietly together and vowing um, that they would be together forever. And eventually, Clara's father got wind of what was going on, and he absolutely refused to consider uh, Robert as a partner for his daughter. He told Robert that if he ever saw him around Clara, he would shoot him, <laughs> among many other nasty things. Um, and he uh, fought back by actually taking Clara on major concert tours all over Europe and even to England. And she was a huge success. She was a superstar. And he was making a lot of money from her. He confiscated all of her money. He took all of her letters and um, confiscated them also. Luckily, she had a very uh, sympathetic maid. And in one year, apparently, the maid managed to smuggle 275 letters between Sh uh, Schumann and Clara, un unbeknownst to her father. This was a harrowing time for the two of them. They were often apart. Uh, he rarely had a chance to see her. And he was going through ups and downs as well in his own career. One bright spot was that he met Mendelssohn at this time, and they became lifelong friends and an instant colleagues and um, really close. And uh, uh, Mendelssohn was a huge support for Schumann in his times of, of uh, need. He wrote another piece called the David's Bundler Tanza, the David's Bund Dances, and he dedicated them to uh, Clara. And he started them out with a uh, uh, mazurka that she had written, and he wrote at the top of the title page, at all times, pleasure and grief go together. Keep faith in pleasure and meet grief with courage. And he managed to get the manuscript to her just as she was being dragged off on another world tour. Um, I'll just play you a couple of things from that also at the beginning, the little mazurka that he starts with that Clara had written. pieces, there's 20 in here, are signed either E or F, and sometimes E and F, so, so this is for Floristan and Eusebius. Again, he's pretending that he wasn't writing them, but his alter egos were writing them. Here's his Eusebius piece. musician, the highest um, honor that a musician could have in, in the empire. Uh, a, a patisserie was named after her, um, <laughs> a Viennese pastry, I guess. Um, and, um, and at home, in, back in Leipzig, uh, Schumann was not sleeping. He had terrible insomnia when he was up, and he was pouring out pieces, among them <clears throat> the Chryslerianna, and also scenes from childhood. And I'll play you another one. I, played you one at the very beginning, and this is another one that everybody will know, 
So this was, again, uh, his promise of domestic bliss in their future. breaking in in Vienna, Schumann went to Vienna, who's also hoping that maybe he would catch Clara there. She knew she was traveling through. He had a tough time there. Uh, this, it was very cliquish and very hard to break in. Um, but he did have one wonderful event happen. He went to see Ferdinand, Schubert's brother, his older brother, and discovered stacks and stacks of these manuscripts that had been lying on shelves for 10 years in Ferdinand's house. And all the symphonies were there, among many other things. He alerted Mendelssohn, and the two of them went and investigated them all. And they were absolutely overwhelmed, and they um, planned a performance of the great C major symphony. I talked about this uh, a bit last week. And it was a huge success, so it put Schubert on the map. And also, um, between Schumann and Mendelssohn, really started the revival and resurgence of Schubert's music. He also wrote, started to write in Vienna, something called the Carnival of Vienna, which uh, he finished when he left. And I'll play you a little bit of that. There's five movements, and there's um, some reference. It, again, it's a sort of very Floristanish uh, opening, then a kind of Eusebius second part, then Floristan comes back. And then um, there's some dances, and then there's a piece that you should recognize I can play it properly, um, that gives you a little a bit of an idea of the po politics that were going on in Vienna at the time.
team that was thrown in in the middle? Is the, the Marseillaise? Yes. <laughs> so what was happening then, of course, uh, e equality, fraternity, and whatever the other one is, was racing all over Europe, and the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire was not amused. So there were spies all over Vienna, and the Marseillaise was absolutely verboten, and uh, you couldn't sing it, you couldn't play it. It was really uh, uh, illegal, so he just flung it in there hoping that nobody would notice, I guess, is his way of thumbing his nose. In 1839, he's now 29 years old, and he and Clara had been hoping to marry for four years. She couldn't by law because she was under 21. So he needed her father's permission to marry, and he filed a legal complaint in the uh, court in Leipzig. Weich uh, tried everything to uh, prevent this court case from going ahead. He didn't show up. He uh, filed all kinds of grievances of himself uh, by himself. What, uh, one of the things that he did, which was really awful, was he sent libelous letters to every musical personage in Europe, practically, about Schumann. He called him lazy, unreliable, childish, conceited, a mediocre composer, incompetent, unmanly, maladjusted, and an alcoholic. And he sent this to critics and musicians and reviewers and concert managers and so on. So Schumann countersued for defamation of character and he lined up all of his influential friends like Mendelssohn and he got the Leipzig town council and the chief of police to vouch for him that he was a model citizen. And finally, after months and months and months, he won his case and he won the right to marry his beloved Clara. Weick finally relinquished her piano. He, impounded it and uh, commented, the comment was she's not worth the trouble. <laughs> so they got married finally in 1840 and just when Clara turned 21 so they could have waited I suppose. Um, Clara was pregnant 10 times in the 13 years that they lived together. They had seven children who survived to adulthood and they started, they had, it was a very modern marriage, a very uh, um, um, honest marriage. They treated each other totally as equals, and certainly they were. Uh, Clara was making more money than Robert most of their marriage, um, and had a huge career on her own. And there were no secrets allowed. They kept a diary together, and each one would write on facing pages about their innermost thoughts and feelings. And that went on for quite a few years, apparently. So uh, it was an interesting modern marriage. The first year of their marriage became known as the Song Year. He wrote over 200 songs in that year, an unbelievable output. And he also wrote at least three superb uh, song cycles, sort of in the manner of Schubert song cycles. So Frau Lieben, Leben, gorgeous, um, Lieder Christ, Dichter Lieben, and so on. These are all the backbone of modern um, leader repertoire. The following year he wrote two symphonies, very quickly, but then fell into a depression again. They pulled him out of it, Clara and he, by playing Bach and studying Bach together. So they used to play Bach fugues together. Um, and the two symphonies were immediately published and they were both extremely successful. So his fame was really going up. He was, he was really very famous by then. The following year, 1842, became known as the year of chamber music. He wrote the great uh, piano quintet, uh, the piano quartet, these are hugely popular still, uh, three string quartets, and um, Clara also was playing and she was a superstar too. So these were a couple who were so very much on the map in terms of music in Europe. In 1844, Clara had been invited to Russia for years and she finally decided to go. And she took Robert with her and it was a disaster for him, it was a huge success for her. He was depressed the whole year, he couldn't function, he was um, not, perform uh, not composing at all. And this is a description of uh, someone in St. Petersburg, wherever they were playing, um, wrote, Clara performed her husband's music and made a tremendous impression. Robert was silent and reserved all evening as usual. He mostly sat in a corner next to the piano, his head bowed down, hair hanging in his face. Clara answered all the questions put to her husband. And at that, that trip, he started having his first auditory hallucinations. Um, and 
it stopped being able to sleep and so on. So it was a horrible year for him. When they finally got back, he got a lot better. In 1845, he wrote the Piano Concerto, which was one of his best and favorite pieces still. But he wanted a regular income, and he applied for the now vacant job of orchestra director in Leipzig. And he was passed over, and uh, they were terribly frustrated by this, so they decided to move. They moved to uh, Dresden. And it was a, a very good move. They had five very productive years there. She won, toured with Jenny Lind, and that was a very successful tour. He wrote an opera. Um, but that, uh, during that time, there were some tragedies, too. They lost their first son, Emil, at 16 months. And very soon after, Mendelssohn died suddenly. So those were huge blows. And again, um, Robert became quite depressed. And then in 1848, uh, Germany sort of erupted in a series of rebellions, and so there were battles in the streets, and uh, it was a, really a revolution. They were at home one day, and there was some pounding on the door, and it was a rebel militia trying to enlist all young men into their forces, and of course they wanted to grab Schumann. Schumann and Clara ran out the back door through the garden gate, apparently, and uh, they had their oldest daughters, I think daughters, with them, left their other children in the house and raced out to the outskirts and, and set up a little house, a little domestic setup in a little village outside of Dresden. And then a couple of nights later, Clara came back in the, in the dark at night. Through the front lines, there were battles going on. She sort of talked her way back to their house, gathered up the other kids and the maid, and talked her way back through the front lines again, back to their little house. So this gives you an idea of the character of this woman, and also she, that she was seven months pregnant at the time, so she was not just a good piano player. Um, that year, when they were sort of exiled to this little village and everything was in upheaval, Schumann did very well, even though everything was you know, falling apart around them. He was a wonderful father when he was in good shape. He took them for many hikes in the mountains, uh, his kids. And um, he also wrote the album for the young, which is uh, teaching um, all kinds of little songs for kids to learn how to play. I'll just play you one, and everybody knows this. This is the only thing my father could play. director in Dusseldorf. And uh, so this was a great job for him. He was very excited and they moved happily to Dusseldorf. The first year was wonderful. They were very popular there. He was very productive, but it didn't last, unfortunately. Um, this is how his concert master in the orchestra, who became his first biographer, described him. Schumann had as little talent for conducting as he had for teaching. He spoke so softly that he couldn't be understood. He needed frequent rests, but he was highly artistic, dignified, and awe-inspiring. So a real complicated uh, character, obviously. Soon there were disagreements about programming, and he actually stopped showing up for some of the concerts, so he was basically fired. But um, his doctor gave him a, a letter saying that uh, he was exhausted and he couldn't continue, and so they actually retired him on full salary. So um, he was lucky and he continued to be supported. The honors were now rolling in from Vienna, which wouldn't accept him at first, even as far as London, he was being named to all kinds of high uh, societies and music. But his mental state really deteriorated from then on. Uh, he started having more auditory hallucinations. He was hearing single tones that wouldn't stop uh, for long periods, and he was also hearing band music, marching bands and so on constantly, so you can imagine how impossible it must have been for him to, to compose. Around that time, he was lucky to meet uh, the great violinist Joseph Joachim, 
and uh, he was inspired to write for violin. He wrote a great fantasy in C major that's a well-known piece, but he also wrote a violin concerto for Joachim, and when Clara and Joachim saw the violin concerto, heard it, uh, they decided that it, it showed too much of Schumann's mental state, and they uh, persuaded him not to have it published. It lay on a, a library shelf in Germany for almost a hundred years, and in the 30s, 1930, somebody sent it to Yehudi Menuhin, who loved it, said this is a great masterpiece, and it's the link between the Beethoven and Brahms violin concerto, so it's obviously now published and part of the repertoire. And then uh, someone came knocking on their door one day with a letter of introduction from Joachim. It was a young man, age 20, with blonde hair, blue eyes, and a little high voice, and his name was Johannes Brahms, and he had a sheaf of manuscripts under his arm, and he uh, was invited in, sat down at the piano, and started playing, and both Clara and Robert were absolutely swept away. Clara said he was sent by God, and Robert wrote in his journal, he was a genius, a man of destiny, and the most significant talent of the day. And in return, Brahms absolutely worshipped Clara and Robert. A year later, Brahms confessed to Joachim that he was madly in love with Clara. So now, <laughs> uh, complicated tales begin. Um, um, he was 14 years younger than Clara. Of course, she was married to his idol, Robert Schumann. Um, so a difficult situation. A year later, Robert was much, much worse, and he had a two-week period where he was really quite psychotic. He thought he was receiving telepathic messages from Schubert, and he was seeing angels and demons and being attacked by wild animals and so on. And this is from Clara's diary. She wrote, I sat by his bed all night. Never will I forget this sight. I suffered the most agonizing tortures along with him. When he was in a slightly better frame of mind, he realized that he was out of control and he um, was afraid of hurting Clara. So he begged her to have him confined in an asylum. And they started to make arrangements for that, but before it could happen, he ran from the house one night when his daughter was supervising. He escaped and ran to a bridge over the Rhine River and jumped into the Rhine. Apparently, he was recognized by some fishermen and brought home. He tried again, and again was, re uh, was recognized and brought home. He got a little bit better for a while, but then there were two more weeks of absolutely frenzied psychosis. And finally, he was taken away by his doctors and confined in an asylum in a town called Endenich, which is quite close to Bonn. Uh, he was allowed, when he was feeling better, to walk into Bonn and visit Beethoven's tomb and or birthplace and so on. Um, but he was not allowed to communicate with any of his family, including Clara. So this was a theory that these doctors had, that the family was the cause, sounds like, the refrigerator mothers in, in autism. Um, so any letters that Clara wrote were confiscated. He wasn't allowed to write to her. She wasn't allowed to visit him. And they were absolutely, completely cut off, and none of the children were allowed to visit. Brahms was allowed to visit, sometimes through, just to talk to him through a hole in the door. And Joachim was allowed to visit. And after about two years, Brahms was visiting one day, and Robert said, uh, has Clara died? I haven't heard from her for so long. And only then Brahms realized that none of the communications were getting through. Clara wrote in her diary around this time, Oh, what agony it is for me. My heart breaks completely. I don't know how he lives, what he does, whether he still hears the voices. Does he ask for me or not? And during that, uh, the first few months, she gave birth to their last child, who they, they named, or she named Felix, after Felix Mendelssohn. So it's hard to imagine what... Uh, a terrible time it was. Eventually, Robert refused to eat and virtually starved himself to death. And in his last few days, finally his doctors allowed Clara to visit it on what turned out to be the day before he died. So this is how uh, Clara described it. He smiled at me and embraced me with great effort. Never will I forget it. For all the world's treasures, 
I wouldn't exchange this embrace. And then he died the next day, and she wrote, I saw him only half an hour later. I stood by him, my ardently beloved husband. All my thoughts went up to God with thanks that he is finally free. Oh, if only he had taken me with him. So you get a feeling for what this relationship was like. I'm going to finish with something that he wrote the year before they married. It's called The Arabesque, and you'll probably recognize this too. Um, again, it's a series of, of very sweet passages with sort of more fiery, different character um, uh, segments in, in the middle. And at the end, there's a very quiet section with a two-note um, sort of motif. Uh, he often put little phrases or motifs or secret codes in for Clara's name, and I always think when I'm playing this that it's, it means Clara, that two-note little motif. So this is the arabesque. Thank you. 
for doing this for us, for bringing these people to life for us, for all the work that it takes to know as much as you do now to make them very real to us. So they were amazing people. That's <laughs> really amazing to them. Yeah. We can lure you back at some point. I know that we're really in Canada now, but we are. Okay. It's a nice time to come to Canada. <laughs> 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 you might have to. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Any questions?